Hello, welcome everybody. Um, just to let you know, and I will put this in the chat as well as soon as everybody joins, but we are recording this session. So if you have any team members that weren't able to join, it will be available on our YouTube channel at some point in the near future. Um, and Tom is going to be going through a deck today and that also will be available. Um, before we get going, we have a little bit of an icebreaker um, for everyone. And <laughs> Angus says, hi, Tom. So open up Hello, your, your chat uh, so that you can get on there. And say, Angus is my nemesis, yes. if everyone uh... So no, full disclosure, full disclosure. Um, Tom is my fitness instructor as well as Angus Tucker's. So he is well loved in the advertising agency industry. Um, gets lots of love from both of us. Kicks our butts regularly. Beard, I would say more than loved. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so we have a little bit of an icebreaker for everybody. And if you can open up your chats, let us know what time you go to bed each night in general. What is your bedtime? Two thirty. Two thirty. What the hell? Jesus. Who? Oh, at twelve a.m. to two a.m. <laughs> Holy cow! Oh, and thank you. Yeah, we were wondering about um and uh, uh the pre-COVID versus the current COVID, and then what will post-COVID be? I, if I could, and if I wouldn't be like made fun of by my husband, I'd probably go to bed at eight thirty, but I stretch it to nine thirty. I am definitely an early to bed, early to rise kind of person. So we're still just letting people in. Keep it coming with your um, with your bedtimes in there. So I'm also curious, how much does everyone generally sleep? So that's question two. Mm. So if you go to sleep at 2.30. Yeah. So let's say you go to bed at 10.30, 11 seems to be fairly standard, a bunch yeah. of 2 to 3 a.m.s. How many hours a night? I'm about 7.5 a every night, I think. Never any less. Cool. So we've got a lot of, yeah, okay. These are all really good times, though, Tom. Like we're seeing a lot in the 7 to uh, 9 hour range, which is pretty good seeing some four hours, five hours. So it's interesting that some people are saying that during COVID, they're sleeping more and better and some are sleeping less and worse. <laughs> I wonder why oh. the more and better is, is it, does it have something to do with workloads? I wonder. Well, you don't have to get up to commute somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a long commute, you can cut, you know, that chunk out. Probably. Ah, so that yep. would help a lot. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm in the uh, roughly the same category because the half hour I gain by not commuting, I'm losing by going to bed later, which I'm trying to fight. But not a hundred percent up to me, I have to say, <laughs> unfortunately. All right. So that's actually kind of interesting information because I uh, I was kind of curious what everyone's experience is. You know, anything like that always tends to. Uh, result in different experiences for people. So um, I had the first week that this started, I had a really tough time sleeping because, you know, as a trainer, I work with people and um, I had no idea how my business is going to go, if I'm going to have any sort of income for the foreseeable future, right? So sleep was tough. So, so why, why don't we just, I'm just letting a couple more people in, Tom, and then we will give yep. you uh, the introduction that you deserve. Okay. Um, and That's actually so, not even part of my talk. This is just like some <laughs> personal uh, yeah. revelations, I guess. Now nah, you guys don't have to listen. It's fine. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't want anybody to miss out on all the personal revelations. That's, <laughs> that's the point. Okay, so it's four oh six. Everyone is in the room. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, joining the ICA community. Um, again, the ICA community is open right now to everybody, members and non-members. 
Um, it's about getting through this together. It might sound cliche, but I think it's, uh, I think we can all agree that we're looking for as much help as we possibly can get right now. Um, and if there's someone out there who's figured something out, we wanna, we wanna hear about it. So as I mentioned to the few folks that um, were joined earlier on, um, Tom is my personal trainer, so full disclosure there. Um, and uh, uh, when I mentioned to him that we were doing these community chats, he was really interested and wanted to participate. He is a fount of knowledge for me. Um, and uh, to the point of that, I'm like, I can't take any more in. Um, so he's been a really fabulous trainer for me. He's also done some really great stuff for us early on in the ICA community about staying physically active during this time. Um, and so if you are interested in getting any of those tips, he's also got a really awesome uh, yoga playlist that he's curated uh, from YouTube. So uh, go ahead and ask me for that and I can pass that along. So um, today I will caveat that he is a fitness trainer. So getting up and doing decks, um, I was flabbergasted when he said he wanted to do a deck for this. Not really in his wheelhouse, but he has put together an amazing presentation for everybody today about how to get better sleep. Um, and I am going to pass it off to you, Tom. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right, thank you. Um, so like Leah said, I'm a trainer. I'm not a sleep expert or a sleep doctor or something like that. So just as an intro, I wanna kind of explain why I got into this. A whole sleep thing. Number one is that, you know, as a trainer, all aspects of your client's health are kind of in your domain to some extent. And so I've been reading up and up about sleep for a while now, but it really um, came to the forefront about, I say about a year ago, um, when I just had this weird bout of insomnia. And I personally very rarely had any sort of issue sleeping for more than a day, you know, maybe extreme stress or uh, anxiety about something, that sort of stuff. Like, to be perfectly honest, the one thing that used to make me not sleep was like having a fight with my wife. That was, you know, it. and then I would be just, and, you know, I can see a lot of people going, eh, exactly. But um, I just had this brief bout of with insomnia and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't sleep. And it was really sudden. It was pervasive to the point where I was getting like an hour a night, maybe two. There was one night where I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep at all. And so I started researching all this stuff and I read books and every article and every study that I could get my hands on. And then finally I figured out that it was my uh, fitness tracker that was causing it. And it was giving me anxiety because it was con continuously telling me that I wasn't getting enough sleep. And the day that I took it off, I since then I literally haven't had an issue sleeping. It was such a weird, sudden thing. But this is the interesting thing about sleep is that um, if you dig around, you can often find out exactly what the problem is, right? So that's why I came up with a. This is there's a lot of stuff that I might be going through here. So I hope you're not going to start fading out because <laughs> hopefully it's all useful. But sometimes it's little things that you can change, and suddenly a lot of sleep issues go away. You know, for me it was that this this it's a device called Woof. So it wasn't a Fitbit, but one made for athletes. And it kept telling me, it's like, you're not getting enough sleep. Six and a half hours, that's, you need nine hours to catch up now. You know, so every day it was adding more sleep to my schedule. And every day I was sleeping six hours or six and a half hours because that's how much I get to sleep because I get up really early. And as soon as I chucked it and I started not worrying about it, I started sleeping fine. So that's just sort of my preamble on why I got really into sleep research. So what I wanna talk about today is three things. Um, one is why do we sleep in the first place? The second thing is um, why do we, why can't we sleep if we have issues? And the third, the biggest topic is how do we improve on that? So how do we sleep better if you have issues? And uh, I'd like to give a host of possible solutions to possible problems. Um, including going over things like um, um, supplements that you can possibly take, ways to reduce nighttime stress, um, and other sort of tips and tricks that uh, scientists recommend to improve sleep. So first, why sleep so important? 
we all know that we need to sleep, right? If you don't sleep for an extended period of time, you die. Um, and essentially the easiest answer to that is that when you sleep, you fix stuff that's broken in your body. So the day-to-day -day, uh, stresses on your body and on your mind are fixed when you sleep. Um, it seems like that cannot take place while you're awake. Um, so primarily for the physical aspect of your body, repairing tissue, rebuilding your immune system would be one of them. Um, you'll find out that the more you sleep, if you're engaged in physical activity, if you're an athlete, for example, you will recover much better if you sleep more, right? Um, with exercise is circular. If you sleep more, you feel much more rested. You can exercise more. And uh, the more you exercise, uh, the more you, muscle you break down, the more tissue you damage, the more sleep you need. So if you're engaged in some sort of serious physical activity, you need to sleep a lot. That's the bottom line. Um, so that's the physical part. The mental part is a really interesting thing because that's what actually breaks down first. If you don't sleep for you know a couple of weeks, there's a, a disease that essentially over time breaks down the brain's ability to produce uh, and access sleep chemicals and you just stop sleeping and after a while, uh, people die from it. And it's the mental aspect that kills people, not the physical aspect. And what research is finding is that the um, interesting part about sleep is that it organizes the brain. So neurons get weeded out, the ones that we don't seem to need anymore, the ones that age, and new ones form, new connections are made. And uh, without sleep, your brain stops functioning. So one of the interesting uh, correlations that has been made recently was that high levels of, or sorry, basically a lack of sleep is really closely associated with uh, brain diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia. It's not 100% of a correlation. There's a genetic component for sure. There's a, a nutrition component, an exercise component. But there's no doubt that on average, people who get uh, degenerative brain conditions tend to sleep less. So it makes sense, right? If you're sleeping less, your brain doesn't recover as well as it could. Um, and it slowly deteriorates over time. So this takes a long time, but um, you know it's something to consider because it's becoming a big issue these days, right? Um, Alzheimer's, par Parkinson's, dementia, these are huge, huge problems. And uh, they seem to be happening earlier and earlier. And who knows, it could be related to uh, the fact that for the last 50 years, we've been losing from an average of about nine hours of sleep down to probably around seven-ish, if I remember the chart correctly. So oh, I should actually use my deck because I haven't. <laughs> so sorry, I'm just going to catch up here. I uh, haven't done this before. So um, REM sleep is the one that uh, tends to work on the brain primarily. Uh, deep sleep is a physical uh, restorative and REM sleep is primarily uh, the brain restorative. So REM sleep is not a deep sleep. It's when you dream. And uh, if you dream, you notice that that's the, the easiest time to wake up, right? Because your brain is actually closest to its um, waking state. Um, so that's why often if you have really intense dreams or nightmares, it doesn't take much to uh, wake, wake up. And then you notice that you wake up and you can often go right back to sleep and continue your dream. So REM sleep is uh, a very interesting process because um, waves get produced in the brain. If you look at the brain through various um, sensors and electrographs, weird looking waves emanate from different parts of the brain. And what those seem to be is connections that are me being made by different neurons. So REM sleep is really strongly associated with creativity, which um, I decided to throw in there because for you guys, that's obviously very important. You're a creative industry. Creativity is really created by sleep. If you don't sleep enough, it's really hard to be creative. Another thing that REM sleep does for people is it, it increases empathy and understanding. And uh, people who don't get enough sleep, especially REM sleep, get really grouchy, as we all know. But it's not just a lack of, it's not just tiredness that makes you grouchy. There's a, a measurable uh, result of, of a lack of uh, concern for others when you don't get enough sleep. 
why that is, I don't know, and it doesn't look like anybody else knows, but the bottom line is that the more you sleep, the better a human being you seem to be. So that's kind of cool. So why can't we get enough sleep? So there's a whole bunch of reasons. You know, um, it's easy to come to, you know, just jump to a conclusion like, well, I'm stressed and so I can't get enough sleep. But lots of people are stressed and get lots of sleep. Um, lots of sleep, lots of people have been, um, you know, lots of people are not stressed and don't get sleep. So there's not a close correlation. There's actually lots of different uh possible reasons for this. So there's two things that um, you can sort of categorize it into. You maybe it's your ability to sleep is a problem. So you have insomnia, but for whatever reason, you just can't fall asleep and you have issues. Um, stress, right? The standard, your mind's constantly going through work. Family situation obviously can be quite stressful. Um, lots of different reasons why you could be stressed and you can't get enough sleep. Uh, sleep apnea could be one. So um, stress often makes it hard to fall asleep. Sleep apnea is one that can wake you up repeatedly. And you may feel like you're getting lots of sleep, but with uh, sleep apnea, you are getting a very poor quality sleep and um, almost no deep sleep. So you could be getting eight, nine hours of sleep with, uh, if you have a sleep apnea and getting very little actual quality rest. Uh, caffeine might be an issue. So I'm going to talk uh, separately about caffeine for uh, a bit because it's kind of important. Um, and then things like jet lag, of course, which is sort of a temporary thing. But jet lag, if you travel frequently, um, the constant changes in the time zone can really mess up your um, ability to actually reset your body to where it's supposed to be. And so there's a supplement called melatonin that I'll talk about later that can be very helpful with that. So that's one thing that's actually not an issue right now because no one's traveling anywhere. But there's lots of people who really mess up their sleeps just because of the constant flying. The other issue other than sleepability is sleep opportunities. So that's the um, essentially you giving yourself the chance to get enough sleep. So that's different from not being able to sleep because you know, I would consider myself to be in this category because I fall asleep no problem now, but if I'm only getting six hours of sleep, that's not enough time to actually get a full uh, amount of rest for me. Um, so, you know, the solutions for that problem are different. And so essentially you're either going to bed too late or you're getting up too early and you're not getting, let's say your seven and a half hours if you want to standardize it for that. So what do you do? You go to bed earlier or you try to get up later. So, the problem is that we have established a society where people are expected to kind of get up and go to bed around roughly the same time. And that's not really reasonable for most people because some people are early birds. Some people go to bed at 9.30, you know, like Leah or nine. And I train her at five because she seems to like to exercise at five. I don't know why, but that's what she does. Um, other people are night owls, so they, you know, my brother would be a great example of this. His ideal sleep time can't be any earlier than 2 a.m. When we were in university, it was more like 4 a.m. sleeping till noon type of routine. You know, um, and then that's so about 40% of people are, are morning people, about 30% are night owls, and then the other 30 are sort of in between. And personally, I know I'm in between. I'm about 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. sleep is ideal for me, you know, plus minus 15, 20 minutes. And um, to have everyone from early morning people to night owls try to be on the same schedule is rough. So this is actually an interesting time because if you think about it, we have removed a lot of the um, obstacles to organizing your sleep the way you need it. So if you're a night owl, you can go to bed and maybe you can wake up later. Um, if you want to get up early, you can, right? So there's actually quite a few um, changes that you can make now to perhaps give yourself more of a sleep opportunity. So we'll talk about that too. So the sleep opportunity situation is interesting because generally the human body sleeps in 90 minute cycles. So sometimes it's actually better to sleep a little bit less if it tells you, if it, if it allows you to um, wake up at the 
top of your sleep cycle. So you cycle down over four stages of deep sleep. Then you tend to come out into light sleep, back down to deep sleep, then you cycle up to REM sleep towards the end of the 90 minutes. So it's, it's not completely um, clear and it's different for different people. But if you wake up in the middle of your deep uh, sleep, when your alarm goes off, it is really hard to get up. And you probably experienced that, I'm sure. Whereas if you're at the top of your REM cycle, when you're closest to being awake, it's very different. So there's an app called Sleep Cycle, which I just found. I haven't tried it yet, but apparently it's really good for this. So it will uh, detect your movements and create an, an idea of when your sleep cycles are happening. And it, you set an alarm time and it adjusts the wake up time to uh, compensate for your sleep cycle. So it would be really interesting. We should run an experiment, have as many people as uh, want try it and then get some feedback and see actually if it made a difference. I'm on a fairly hard schedule, so it doesn't work too well for me, unfortunately, which is not great. But if you have a slightly flexible schedule, it might be worth trying. If you find that you seem to get a decent amount of sleep, but you're kind of groggy in the mornings and it takes a while to get up, it might be worth trying it because it could be that you're um, coming up out of a really deep sleep stage and it takes you a while to uh, wake up. Actually, I should mention that sometimes it's okay to take a while to wake up. You know, we, we seem to have this idea that as soon as you wake up, there should be this immediate, um, you know, sunny moment where you jump out of bed and you're ready to go and that's not really the case the, the body takes a while to wake up even if you are rising from REM sleep right you, you basically shut your body down for eight hours or so it will take a little while to wake up half an hour is almost like a minimum but if if an hour later is when you really start feeling like okay i'm ready to go now and i'm rested that's not abnormal that's okay so that's kind of important so I just want to talk about caffeine for a second. So caffeine keeps you awake, right? It makes you more alert. And um, a lot of people have very little sensitiv sensitivity to it, meaning that you can drink a bunch of coffee and you can fall asleep, no problem. Um, other people are extremely sensitive to it to the point where even a little bit like my wife is one of these where it's almost like an allergic reaction where even, you know, um, it just sends her over the, uh, the edge. Uh, most people are sort of in between. So if you have trouble sleeping, it's not a bad idea to, to try to reduce your caffeine intake. Um, you don't have to. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't drink caffeine coffee if you don't have problems sleeping. Because uh, if you have ca coffee in the morning, by the nighttime, it's mostly cleared out of your system. However, if you're having trouble sleeping, or if you'd like to nap and you can't because the caffeine is keeping you up, it might not be a bad idea to try to cut it out. Caffeine is an adrenaline mimicker. So if you're overstressed, for example, or you're feeling really anxious, you tend towards anxiety, um, the whole situation right now has got you down and you're, you know, you're just really worked up over stuff. Caffeine makes all of that worse. It's, it's basically like giving yourself a shot of adrenaline. Um, and if you have issues like that, cut it out slowly, I would say. So maybe try like a half, half decaf first for a couple of days or reduce how much co uh, coffee you drink, especially if it's several cups a day, because I don't know if you tried quitting coffee, uh, cold turkey before, but I get horrible headaches and it's a complete nightmare. Um, so I'm working on reducing my caffeine intake because I'm finding that I'm just a little bit too, you know, um, jittery right now mostly because I'm doing these talks and I'm not used to these. So a whole bunch of people staring back at me is kind of, you know, uh, anxiety inducing for me. But if you do have anxiety issues, if you do have sleep issues, anything like that, you feel overstressed, you feel overworked, cut, cut out your caffeine. I think you will find that it'll be highly beneficial and it'll make it a lot easier to fall asleep. Because think about it, if your heart rate's already... 110 for no particular reason and you have three cups of coffee and it's not 125 that's not going to help if you don't have anxiety issues caffeine is actually a bit of a brain booster right it helps kind of get the creative juices flowing um you probably experienced if you have too much of it it just puts you into overdrive and then your um, brain just turns into a complete jumble 
um, when scientists uh, put spiders on various drugs and made them weave webs, caffeine produced the least coherent web of all, including all the hard drugs. So that that's kind of tells you that too much of it really messes with your brain. So that's just a little side note on caffeine because I've had success with a couple of clients over the last few years who really improved their sleep habits just by cutting out coffee and then essentially giving up caffeine altogether and switching to herbal tea or something like that. If, if you like, you know, my big thing is I just like the, I love coffee. I love the taste of really good coffee and I hate not having it, but I also find that it's just kind of like the ritual of drinking something warm in the morning, right? And so I just switched to, I have a set of teas around my uh, workstation. I just drink tea all day and that kind of keeps, you know, the um, addiction at bay a little bit. So anyway, that's my spiel on caffeine. Um, so the real crux of the matter here is how to sleep better if you are not sleeping well. Or if you are sleeping fairly well, but you would like to sleep longer. Right, those, like I said, those are two separate things. So again, I forgot about the desk, the deck here. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of uh, different possible solutions to this issue. So sleep opportunity, doo -doo -doo, we talked about this, there's my caffeine. I really should keep on this. Sorry, Leah, I'm terrible at this. So how to be a better sleeper. So the two categories I like to discuss is chemical solutions and practical solutions. So chemical means any, anything that you put in your body to try to change your brain chemistry. Looks like people are chatting. I probably should have this open or something. I don't know. Yeah, here's Leah's, Leah's yelling at me about the slides. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sorry, Leah. I, I'm an amateur here. So chemical solutions. Um, I put supplements separately because they're also technically chemical solutions, but these are the things that um, people take that are not supplements. So, and how, I just want to go through how they affect your body a little bit. So, you know, putting you to sleep alcohol, probably the most widely abused drug for sleep reasons or sleep purposes, the same way that caffeine is the opposite, the most widely abused drug to counter use your drowsiness or your sleep. So alcohol is a sedative and it does help you fall asleep. No question about it. Um, some people tend to have a more active reaction, to it, but, but for most people, it just kind of depresses your system down a little bit and it does help you fall asleep. And there's two big problems with alcohol. One is that as a sedative, it has a similar effect on the body that, for example, anesthetics have or um, um, coma pharmaceuticals. Um, barbiturates like Valium, all these things. Sedatives do not create sleep, they create sedation. So when you're sedated, you're not really sleeping. You're just in some sort of comatose-like state. So you're not really resting. You're, you're not producing the, um, the brain improvements. You're not producing the neural connections. You're not working on your creativity and all this stuff, right? So the negative effects of alcohol kick in when you are starting to feel inebriated, right? So having a little bit, so a couple of drinks, it's not a huge deal. It, it just helps you fall asleep. So I'm not telling people not to drink unless you tend to be really, really sensitive to it, right? If you're like, oh, you have a beer and you're under the table, then maybe you shouldn't be drinking, right? But that's kind of a general rule, I'd say. So if you have a couple of drinks and you feel like you're getting a little bit drowsy, but you're not actually drunk from it, that's not a big deal. That's not going to change anything about your sleep. And if it helps, fine, whatever. The problem is that if you have a drinking problem or if you're splitting half a bottle with your spouse, you know, or so if you're splitting a bottle, so you get half a bottle, which is quite a bit, right? Especially if it's condensed. What happens is the first half of the night, you're kind of sedated. So you're not getting good quality sleep. You're sleeping deeply, you think, because you are, um, you know, you're not really aware of anything, but it's not good quality deep sleep. The second half of the night, what happens is when the alcohol wears off, your body just kind of springs out of that sedation and it often wakes up. So if you've been out partying and you had too much to drink, you may have had that effect where you, you go to bed, you, you know, you sleep like a log and then the second half of the night, you're tossing and turning a lot. 
I know that for me, that's definitely uh, the situation. And a lot of people I talk to complain about the exact same thing. So with alcohol, fine, but not too much. I mean, that's pretty much the situation if you're drinking alcohol in the first place, right? So um, that's all I got to say about that. If you have, you know, alcohol issues, maybe you should talk to someone. Sleeping pills. Um, I haven't tried any. I can't give you any personal information on this. And I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to recommend or not recommend a prescribed pharmaceutical. Generally, the consensus seems to be that they will help short term if you're having bouts of insomnia. The problem is that they can become addictive. So you can get used to them and then it becomes even more difficult to try to get to sleep. That's one of the big problems. Um, the other problem is that they don't fix the underlying issues. So if you have stress related issues, if you have, you know, um, sleep cycle issues where your natural cycle doesn't match what you're trying to force on your, uh, your sleep routine, it doesn't fix that. It just sort of masks, masks the problem temporarily. And then you're going to have an issue as soon as you try to uh, quit the sleep drugs. And that's why they tend to get, um, addictive because as soon as you try to stop using them, you can't sleep again. So, like I said, I don't recommend or not recommend them. If you have thought about trying them, I would highly recommend le reading up as much as you can and make sure that you know about the potential side effects, of which there are many. Cannabis, again, I don't know. I'm not a, a habitual weed user. Seems to be similar to alcohol in how it, uh, most people react. There's a uh, a couple of different strains of it. I think the Indica versus sat, uh, Sativa, I believe. Uh, Indica, I think, is the one that helps you relax and, you know, go to sleep. Don't mix them up because the, apparently the other strain is much more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It basically wakes you up as opposed to puts you to sleep. So you've got to be careful about uh, which one you use. So consult your local cannabis expert. Um, Again, the same issue as uh, alcohol is that it is somewhat of a sedative. We don't really understand a lot of its effects on the brain because there's been such a, a um, taboo around cannabis research for the last you know, 75 years. We don't really know how much it affects the brain and in what ways. So same rules apply. If um, a little bit is good, more is probably not necessarily better. Uh, it also seems to disrupt sleep later in the night. Um, so again, the least is the best as far as I can tell and I'm going to click on my slide now on time so supplements there's four supplements that I would recommend potentially trying for people there's probably 50 out there you know 5,000 10,000 that you can buy on Amazon and in supplement stores they all tend to be mixes of various um, sleep inducing uh, chemicals um, magnesium valerian melatonin and l-theanine are the four that i recommend and has some decent research behind it as far as um, helping sleep there's a lot of other ones uh, that you'll come across probably and they may work or they may not um, a lot of stuff is based on very minimal research on mice or on, on cells in labs and people often come up with supplements very quickly um, and it may not even work for people. And at worst, uh, they could be detrimental for long-term in, in, for long-term use. The other problem that I have with supplements is that dosing can be quite tricky because supplement companies, especially small ones, um, are really, really bad at properly dosing each individual pill or tablet. So this is not a well-known issue, but you really want to start anything with the least amount that you can. So if you need to break something in half, start there. Because, uh, for example, vitamin D, which is, you know, not necessarily a sleep supplement, but it's good for you. Um, one research study that I saw showed that uh, the amount of vitamin D in the 10 or so supplements that they measured ranged from zero to 200 percent of the actual label. So think about that. You could be getting double of what you think you are, or you could be getting none of it, right? 
So if you're trying to take something to help you sleep and it's an active ingredient, and if you're taking double of what it says and you're already on the higher end of the dosage because you're like, hey, let's try something and because you know, I really want to get a good night's sleep, you could be in for trouble. So please don't do that. So magnesium is probably the least potentially problematic. It's a mineral that your body needs in fairly large amounts. Um, usually people uh, need about four or 500 milligrams, so that's half a gram, it's almost gram dosage of, uh, on a daily basis. So magnesium is a relaxant, primarily a muscle relaxant, but it also helps the nervous system relax a bit too. And it's not going to help you fall asleep. So if your problem is falling asleep, it's not gonna be particularly helpful, but if your problem is staying asleep, it could really well work well. And the reason for that is that it puts you in a deeper state of relaxation. So it's not a sedative, but it's a relaxer. So once you're asleep, a lot of people, including me, find that it really helps them sleep well. So there's um, one caveat with magnesium. So there's basically no downside to it because your body needs it. People tend to be deficient in it. Uh, the, the soil we grow our food tends to be low in magnesium. So supplementing with magnesium is generally recommended anyway. It's one of like basically three things that I take regularly. The other one being vitamin D and vitamin C. Uh, I try to take it most days. Uh, the only caveat is that it can give you really crazy dreams. So if you're prone to dreaming a lot and they wake you up and they're the ones that disrupt your sleep, uh, or you're prone to nightmares, uh, magnesium can make them worse. And even if you're not, it can really like mess with your brain about what it does to your dreams. Um, especially if you haven't done it before. It, my personal experience is that if you take it regularly before bed over a period of time for which for me was probably about two years, that effect has slowly gone away. So I don't seem to react nearly as much to it unless I don't take it for a while and then I start. So don't be surprised if you take magnesium and then you wake up and you're like, what the hell was that? Like, what? you know, that's actually fairly normal. So I didn't put dosage on here, but dosing, um, usually magnesium comes in uh, 150 milligram capsules and a regular dose for a female is around 300 milligrams. So that's two capsules and for a male is about 450. I would again start with a single dose of 150 for everyone because you want to try things first. Um, and also the form of the magnesium is important because you have magnesium of all different types that you can buy in stores and some are completely inaccessible by the human body. And a, another physical effect of unabsorbable magnesium is that it gives you diarrhea. So don't buy cheap crap magnesium. Uh, magnesium oxide is the least useful. Um, you generally only see it in multivitamins. So the magnesium in multivitamins is almost unabsorbable. Citrate is uh, the next one that you see everywhere. It seems to be fine. I, that's what I'm using right now. And I'm, I seem to have the same reaction to it as everything else. And then there's more complicated versions like glycinate, bisglycinate, aspartate, you'll see here and there, uh, chelated magnesium, um, they seem to be fairly well absorbed. I can't say that I've tried any that didn't work for me. So avoid oxide and you should be okay. Uh, valerian is a plant extract, which is uh, a mild sedative. Um, I've only tried it in tea form, something called sleepy tea, which I found at a farmer's market. Again, completely untested. I mean, for all I know, it could have been full of who knows what, right? But Let's go and pretend that it didn't. Um, it produces a, basically it makes you drowsy, just like other uh, sedatives. It's herbal, but doesn't mean much, right? It's still chemicals. It still uh, affects your body in various ways. Um, don't overdo it. You could try the tea. You can try maybe a, a small um, amount in a supplement form and see how it goes. Again, um, it doesn't seem to have too many side effects from what I could tell. And the research on it, is fairly good. Uh, it definitely helps people sleep and it seems to have the least amount of side effects out of all the various um, potential supplements out there. Um, so if you want to give it a shot, you can. Um, most pharmacies will sell it in some form, uh, health food stores as well. Melatonin is a hormone and it's one of the major sleep regulators in the human body. Uh, some of you may have actually tried it. The 
best use for it is uh, resetting your sleep cycle. So if you were, if you think your sleep cycle's off, so for example, you've been going to bed really late and you want to move your sleeping uh, more to the earlier in the evening, melatonin is a good way to do it. You, you take it a couple hours or so before uh, your sleep, your scheduled sleep time, and it slowly shuts your body down and gets you ready for sleep. It's also great for jet lag. So if you need to quickly readjust your uh, sleep time, melatonin is probably the best way to do it because it, it doesn't um, put you to sleep by sedation or anything like that. It actually changes your your brain chemicals to put you to sleep earlier. So the only problem with it, again, is that if it works really well, but there are underlying issues, um, it could become you know, a little bit addictive in that you won't be able to fall asleep without it. And you generally don't want to get in that situation because that actually causes more stress because now you think you're dependent on some foreign substance to make you fall asleep. Um, and the last one I can recommend is something called L-theanine. And it is a, an amino acid that's found in abundance in tea, especially green tea. And it's, again, a really good relaxant. A lot of people love this stuff. It's, it's almost um, has a similar effect to smoking cannabis on a lot of people without the high side effects. It just sort of just slowly just relaxes everything. Some people react very strangely to it. So again, slow, uh, small doses. I think uh, the recommended minimum or maximum dose to start is around 100 milligrams. So if you want to try it, don't do more than that and see what happens. I have not tried it personally, uh, so I can't comment on it. I'm actually thinking about maybe just, just so that I can give people some advice on how it feels. Um, some people react strangely to it, like anything else uh, supplement. Um, that's it. My guess is that I haven't done a lot of research on it, that it's a precursor to probably some brain chemicals. And anytime you mess with the brain chemical chain, you tend to have odd reactions depending on your own brain chemistry. But the research on it is pretty good and uh, it doesn't have a lot of side effects. So it's worth a shot. If you, if you feel like it's a, relax, a relaxing experience that you're looking for in the evening, like that would be helpful, it might be worth a shot. I would definitely not try it combined with valerian because they're both relaxants slash sedatives and mixing stuff like that is generally not a good idea. You just don't know how things can react. You know, you add a half a bottle of scotch to it and then things kind of get crazy. So I mentioned that it's found in tea. The problem with tea is that it's got caffeine in it for one and it has a couple of other stimulants in it too and also a very strong antioxidant that tends to um, increase your metabolic rate. Uh, um, very long name that I can't remember right now. Anyway, so substituting green tea or even black tea for the supplement is not necessarily a good idea because for me, I find that green tea just really amps me up and it just bumps up my metabolic rate and actually start to overheat. And that's, uh, and being cool at night is one of the signals for your body to uh, shut down and start getting ready for sleep. So if anything that you do that makes you warm, it's not gonna be particularly helpful. So actually hot showers are useful um, because when you get out of the shower, you cool down because of the evaporation of the water. And uh, so having just a quick hot shower and then letting your body cool down a little bit can be a good way to induce sleep. So that's the chemical way to try to get yourself to sleep better. Um, I want to go over the uh, practical solutions. And I think to, to me, this is the real important stuff because this is how you change your behaviors. This is how you change your brain to think itself to sleep. And you give yourself the best chance to sleep well, not by changing your body chemistry, which is temporary, right? But by actually changing your habits. So there's five that I've come up with that I think are, you know, fairly easy to implement if you uh, have issues. What's going on? I have 15 minutes. Oh boy, we're just getting to the good stuff. So number one, reduce stress and work before bedtime, right? If you, you know, it's easy to say this. It's really hard to implement if you have a, a schedule, especially now where schedules have really gone out the window, you know, but 
you have to have a separation between your sleep and brain activity. So anything that gets your brain going, if you, if you have trouble sleeping, is, is going, going to be bad. You know, if you tend to stress out over uh, things even a little bit, thinking about that stuff is um, not going to be beneficial to you trying to sleep. Some people can work in bed and then put their laptop down and then fall right asleep, right? That's fine. That, I, that's not an issue. The problem is that if you can't sleep and you, you keep working because you have to finish stuff, I think it's probably a better option to um, put the stuff away, try to sleep, and then do it, get up earlier and do it, then you're probably going to be uh, more productive. Um, if you're not sleeping through the night because you're so amped up about work, it's not particularly beneficial. So about two hours is what you need as a break. So if you go to bed at 11, try to shut everything down by nine. That's, and that, I mean, that should be doable. Like really, should any, any one of us be working past 9 p.m.? I don't think so. Um, the interesting thing is that even other stressful things can cause a problem, like watching stressful shows or uh, playing stressful video games. Like, you know, if you into multiplayer games where you're shooting people all the time and it really gets you going, Maybe that's not the best thing to do before bedtime. Um, exercise. If you exercise really late, that's a problem because you crank up your heart rate, your adrenaline goes sky high, and uh, it's not going to be beneficial. Um, when I played Ultimate Frisbee uh, years ago, a lot of the um, um, games were right at around 9 o'clock, so I didn't get home till probably past 11. It was, no matter how tired I was, and I was course, physically exhausted, but... There's just no way that I could fall asleep. And it took me probably close to two hours to just to get like my heart rate down and my, you know, the competitive juices to stop flowing and the adrenaline to get back down. And, you know, people play hockey and the arenas are often available quite late. It's, um, it's a problem and it can really affect you. So you're trying to do something good for yourself by exercising and it's actually causing you sleep issues and that's not great. So if stress is an issue, um, there are a whole bunch of apps that you can try to maybe accelerate the process of coming down from this excited, stressful uh, uh, state. There's something called relaxed melodies, um, which essentially allows you to construct a melody and anything that you find quite relaxing. Some people like something in the background, music in the background or TV on in the background. Um, and this app will basically shut down after a while so that it's not blaring, you know, or it's not being intrusive once you fall asleep. Um, so you could give that a shot. Sleep cycle that I mentioned, right? That times your uh, sleep cycle so that um, you wake up at the best time, but it also helps you just understand your sleep cycle so you can time your bedtime so that when you know you have to wake up, let's say at 7 a.m., you know um, that how many 90 minute cycles before that you should try to roughly fall uh, asleep. Uh, there's other things like DigiPill and Pillow, I think, on uh, the uh, Apple system. Insight Timer, which actually my daughter uses. I have an eight-year-old who struggles with falling asleep because she has just, she's, you know, she has anxiety. She was born that way. And she loves an app called Insight Timer. And she listens to uh, bedtime stories on her headphone. And it's just some person talking in a very relaxed voice. And it's been very helpful. So if you have any kids or any uh, children that you know who have trouble sleeping, that might be worth a shot. Actually, it's been really good. It's been a complete lifesaver for us. And um, it's really good. So number two, I made separate uh, cool slides for all of these. So blue light exposure. This is a, a really interesting one because um, until we started researching sleep, people didn't realize that different types of light affect the brain differently. And it's blue light that actually makes your brain wake up. So if you're staring at a screen, and modern screens are quite heavy on the blue light, they're quite bright, like bright white light has a heavy um, uh, blue light content. Whereas old time TVs, the cathode ray tubes, and old time incandescent bulbs, uh, you know, candles, uh, gas lights, all this stuff, they turn to uh, produce a lot more yellow light. So uh, they didn't affect sleep as much as modern technology does. And we also use a lot of LEDs, which uh, are quite bright. 
So reducing blue light exposure, if you, if you have to work or you have to, or you, you uh, like to read on a tablet, for example, um, reducing your uh, blue light exposure can be very helpful. Um, there are blue light blockers built into almost every um, fairly decent new device now. My phone has a night light, uh, night light option and I actually have it on all the time. I actually find it makes my phone look generally better, but I never take it off anymore. Um, the other option is if you think that blue light is an issue, if you want to look at screens or um, you know, you're know you in a lit environment. So for example, if you were a shift worker, things like that, uh, blue light glasses can be quite useful. And a lot of people love this stuff and, and have made a lot of, you know, claims about how just wearing blue light glasses for a couple hours uh, before bed has really made a huge difference to their sleep patterns. And if you think about it, um, you're counteracting your brain's basic um, instinct to wake up by being exposed to blue light. So it's a really great way to get your brain chemistry in order without, you know, ingesting any chemicals. So it might be worth a shot if, if you have to do screen work before you go to bed or uh, you think that's an issue. They're not expensive. They're basically just one of those ugly old glasses that old people wear, but except tinted, they're just tinted blue and um, it's worth a shot. So three more things quickly that I wanna get through. One is getting to bed and waking up at the same time is really important because your sleep cycle, uh, your circadian rhythm is affecting your sleep cycle very heavily. So if you wake up at different times, you go to bed at different times, it's really difficult to come up with a regular time for your brain to know when to sleep. This is one of my issues because um, I start really, really early most days, but maybe I have a couple of cancellations and I have a chance to sleep in a little bit than I do. On the weekends, I start later, and try to sleep in again, right? It is not ideal. And it took me probably somewhere like six to seven years to get used to the whole idea of um, falling asleep on time on Sunday. Because what's happened is that I tended to sleep in uh, on the weekends and um, I woke up too late, eight, nine o'clock. And then if you wake up around 8.30 or nine, trying to get to sleep, you know, 10 o'clock, like 12, 13 hours later, you're just not tired. So then I didn't sleep well. And then it was, you know, 11 o'clock and then I was still awake. And now the stress kicked in about not sleeping enough and knowing that I have to get up at five and then I couldn't fall asleep at all. So it turned into this vicious cycle where because I was sleeping in, I was actually causing an entire week's worth of sleep disruption because I woke up Monday completely sleep, sleep deprived. So trying to stick to your sleep schedule on the weekend is really important. You can adjust it by a bit, by an hour or so, but more than that, uh, and you are going to cause problems. And incidentally, what caused me to uh, regulate my sleep schedule is I had kids and kids wake up early and it doesn't matter if it's the week or the weekend, they're up by six usually. And uh, there you go. Super. So one of the issues is that if you're really tired, you might actually go to bed too early and then you wake up too early and then you have a couple hours in your night you have to push yourself back a little bit, right? You gotta find that sweet spot where you sleep the best. So if you feel like you have to go to bed by 9.30, but then you wake up at 3, 3.30, 4, and you can't fall back asleep, maybe you just went to bed a little bit early. And it's not because that's your natural sleep cycle, it's because you're just overtired from a lack of sleep. So just try to push it back a bit. One of the ways you can do that is the next topic, which is you have a nap. So being smart about napping is really important because you nap too much and you push your sleep start back too far and then you can't fall asleep and then stress cycle, you don't get enough sleep and then you need a long nap, negative vicious cycle, right? But a little nap can be really useful because it just resets your brain, wakes you up, it gets you going and uh, it's incredible how much better you can feel after just 15, 20 minutes, which is about what I would recommend, 30 minutes, absolute max, 30 minutes in, you're starting to go down into the deeper stages and it gets really hard to uh, wake up. If you need a really long nap, let's say you missed a whole night of sleep or you're totally jet lagged and you have to catch up, you have something important to do, do a 90 minute nap then. So you go through a full sleep cycle, right? And then that's going to be very, very refreshing. 
and you will feel pretty good because when you wake up, you wake up from your REM sleep, not from a deep sleep. Um, so 90 minutes uh, can actually be much better than either 60 minutes or two hours. The problem is that that's quite a restful, a long period of restful sleep. So you may end up pushing your sleep cycle back and now instead of helping yourself, you cause the same problem with uh, not being able to fall asleep. So short little cat naps are really good. Um, I have trouble napping, always have my entire life, unless I'm extremely exhausted to the level of passing out or very sick, I have real trouble falling asleep. But I just close my eyes for 15 minutes and basically turn, try to turn my brain off. It's sort of borderline meditation. Um, I find that is actually amazing. You really notice a big difference after. And all it is, is you give your brain a break. And you'll notice this process is going on. Things are happening in your brain. You know, the monkey brain keeps going, it keeps churning, but it's not conscious. It's sort of at a lower level. And uh, it's, it's a really good sort of rest. And you can do that, you know, even if you're just to interrupt your work, if you're feeling really tired, just close your eyes, rest for a little bit. And what you, I often find is that if I'm trying to write, for example, if I'm coming up and, and I, there's no creativity, just a little break like that, often I come back and there's suddenly there's just like the creativity, right? It's just, it's there and it's crazy how much your brain just works on it in the background and suddenly you, it's amazing how much better your um, uh, writing gets. So the last thing that I want to get through is something that's actually a problem for my wife and I, because we live on a, a semi-busy street, you know, in Leaside, where in Toronto, where there's a lot of birds, there's a lot of trees, and it, we like to have our window open and those damn birds starting in about April, every morning, 4.30 a.m., they wake us up. And I love birds. They're great. Birds are fantastic but I hate being woken up. And when I have to get up at 5.15 and a bird wakes me at 4.30 right, right outside my window, cardinals, they're, they're the worst. Uh, I just wanna do bad things to them. So quiet is really important, right? And so is darkness, um, especially now when you, um, sun's up earlier, your um, windows, you know, exposed to light. If you're waking up early, uh, and now you have to wake up even earlier because it's light leaking out around your curtains or something like that. It's very frustrating. So try to make your room as dark as you can and try to make your room as quiet as you can. Uh, earplugs are great. Face masks are great. Lots of people swear by them. Um, what's Leah saying? Move your slide. Oh, sorry. There you go. Hey, there we go. So um, a fan is really good. That's what we use for noise um, cancellation purposes. We just have a fan running in the background fall months of the year and I sleep with earplugs. That helps tremendously to me. Um, if you find that light is an issue and you can darken, darken your room enough, a face mask is great um, or a combination of both. But giving yourself the best chance to have a good sleep is really important, especially if you have trouble falling asleep and on the back end, you could be sleeping, let's say till seven or eight o'clock. If you're waking up by noise, if you're woken up by sound, you know, buses or trucks or cars or who, who knows what, give yourself a chance to try to get as much good sleep at the end of the night as you can. And that would be very helpful. So in conclusion, sleep is important and you should get some. Uh, quick takeaway, you know, the four biggest things that I think I can recommend is Try to go to bed earlier if you tend to be a late sleeper because you're doing things. And often we, um, we don't do anything useful. We're just wasting time because you just don't want to go to sleep for some weird reason. So try to get to bed earlier. Give yourself more sleep opportunity. Get more rest. Don't work too late. Uh, working late tends to cause stress. Stress is not good for sleep. Drink less if you drink too much. Very simple, right? One or two drinks a day uh, per night is plenty. Uh, helps you sleep. More than that is a problem. And reduce caffeine if it's an issue. Again, if it's not an issue, don't worry about it. But if you tend towards anything like being overstressed, being anxious, having trouble sleeping, 
uh, you know, scatter thoughts, all that stuff, try reducing your caffeine and any other stimulant that you use and uh, you should have some benefits fairly quickly from that. I know that for me, it makes a big difference if I really reduce my caffeine intake if I'm overstressed. So that's it. Sorry about um, not going through the deck. Um, like Leah said, I'm a trainer. I, this is all fairly new to me. So anyway, hope everyone uh, learned a few things from this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, if anybody has uh, any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, uh, and, uh, and yes, we have um, Leo Burnett uh, has created a sleeps podcast. And so Paul's gone ahead and put that um, in the chat for you. Uh, it's really interesting. Again, Tom made that connection between creativity and sleep. We cannot be creative if we can't um, sleep. So Leo Burnett had some of their creatives create a podcast so that you could fall asleep. Um, like the fake Fox News death by a thousand revisions and how to assemble a CNC machine router. So all things that should definitely be able to put you asleep. I listened to a couple of them and uh, I almost fell asleep at my desk. So check that out. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, if no one has any questions, we have recorded this session. So that will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, very shortly and we also will have the deck for you so you can go ahead and email any one of the ICA team and they will help you out with that. Have a good evening everybody. Thank you for joining the ICA community. Um, check out the schedule at ICA.ca forward slash community. We've got a couple of really great sessions coming up next week and thank you very much Tom. Appreciate you joining the ICA community again. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks for having me. Hope everyone Thanks, learned something. Bye.